other Lazarus. We've all heard the story from John's Gospel in chapter 10 about Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, Lazarus, the friend and disciple of Jesus, Lazarus who had a home where Jesus would visit and his disciples would visit and they would have a place together, a time together, a place to retreat to, to be safe where Jesus would teach Mary and Martha, would work, and Lazarus would be there. In John's Gospel, we hear that Lazarus got sick, and Jesus took his sweet time getting there to see him, and so before he got to Bethany, Lazarus had died. They came out and told him, if you'd only been here, he need not have died, and he said, Where have you placed him? Oh, we can't let you see him. We can't let you get into the tomb. After all, he's been dead for over three days. He's going to be stinking. So Jesus had them roll the stone away from the tomb, and then he cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And in that moment that kind of reminds me of a horror film, you see in your mind's eye this guy wrapped in in, in burial cloths coming out of the tomb. And quite frankly, it reminds me of the mummy. And if I had been there, there'd been a great shaped hole in the wall as I was trying to get away from that scene. We know that story about Lazarus. Lazarus, who was raised from the dead by Jesus. Lazarus, the friend of Jesus. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. Lazarus, the one who experienced the resurrecting power of Jesus in what must be probably the most amazing miracle that he worked in his ministry. This Lazarus, the one from today's reading from the Gospel of St. Luke, however, while he shares lots of things with Lazarus from John, is a different Lazarus. This is a poor Lazarus who used to live outside the gate of a rich man's house. And the rich man was, he dressed in good clothing and he was always feasting on good food. And Lazarus, meanwhile, laid across the threshold of the gate to his house. He was very sick. He had sores and the dogs would come and lick his sores. Everybody go, ooh. Ugh. He was so poor, so pathetic. He wanted to eat the crumbs off the rich man's table. He was so poor. And it says in the story, Jesus says that Lazarus died and he went to be with his ancestor Abraham. The Jewish people believe that when you were righteous and you died, you went to Sheol where you slept with your ancestors. You resided with them. We get the phrase, rest in peace from this idea that when you die, you go and you rest with your ancestors. Well, Lazarus went and rested with Father Abraham. He went and slept with his ancestors, including the greatest ancestor of all the Jews, Father Abraham. Meanwhile, the rich man, he died and was buried. And it describes him in Hades being tormented. And he looks over and he sees Lazarus Lazarus next to Abraham, and he says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to me to dip his finger in water and drop water on my tongue because I'm in agony here in these flames. I think it's kind of fascinating. Here's this rich man. All of his life he was able to order people around, and he thinks even though he's in hell, he ought to be able to order people around still. Things don't change, do they? You think he would have learned something? Not yet. Not yet. Abraham's reply is very simple. Lazarus here in his life was poor, had very little, had nothing. You in your life had much. Now the roles are reversed. Besides that, there is a chasm between us and you. And we can't come over to your side And you can't come over to our side. So the rich man says, okay, I've got five brothers who are still alive. Please send Lazarus to them to warn them to change their ways. 
And Abraham says, and I think this is fascinating because Abraham lived before Moses and the prophets. He says, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. They've already got everything they need to know and believe from Moses and the prophets. They've got the covenant relationship from Mount Sinai. They've got the prophets warning the people to be true to the covenant relationship. They should listen to them. Oh, but look, I didn't listen to them when I was young. They're not listening to them now, Abraham. But if someone were to rise from the dead, certainly they would listen to him. And Abraham says, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. No truer words have been spoken. This was about sending Lazarus back from the grave to warn the rich man's five brothers. Not the Son of God being raised from the dead, but we know from 2,000 years of history, we know from 2,000 years of history now that the world, having had Moses, having had the prophets, having had the warnings of Scripture, and rejected them, has also rejected the ultimate resurrection from the dead, has also rejected God himself in human flesh, has also rejected Jesus of Nazareth being raised from the dead and what that means for us. And it's not just the world that's rejected the message. It's not the, just the world that's the rejected the messenger. My brothers and sisters, the church is guilty of it too. We get hung up with rules and regulations, with boards and committees, with books of discipline and structures. We get hung up in all the trappings of the institutional church, so much so that we find ourselves not doing what the gospel calls us to do, not living as the gospel calls us to live, not treating our sisters and brothers as the gospel would call us to treat them. Instead, we're watching out for number one, me, myself, and I. We're watching out for our own personal concerns, our own interests, our own likes and dislikes. We're doing our own thing and rationalizing it trying to make it jive with what we know from Scripture we should be doing. We're twisting the Word of God. That's what the Pharisees were doing. It's why Jesus addressed this story to them. See, the Pharisees believed in keeping the law of Moses and paying attention to the prophets. And they also believed in the resurrection from the dead. And what Jesus is telling them very simply is, you have rejected the law and the prophets. And you're not going to pay attention to the resurrection from the dead either. Oh, my brothers and sisters, we are just like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. We say good things with our lips, but then we don't follow through with our bodies. We make a profession of faith, but it, the instant it comes out of our lips it falls flat because we don't live our lives accordingly. I was in New York City several years ago at a meeting of the General Board of Global Ministries. And at this meeting, we had a very long series of discussions on taking the Emmaus movement into Europe and how we were going to handle that. It was in conjunction with the Board of Discipleship. And it was a very fascinating experience. It was an excellent set of meetings. I had had a wonderful time. Of course, I'd also had to have, got to have some of that New York pizza during the evening breaks. Wow, they know how to make pizza up in New York City. Anyway, it was time to go home, to get on the subway, to head back to John F. Kennedy International Airport to come home. So I was going down the steps to get to the subway station off of 50th Avenue, a little street, 
and 8th Avenue. Yeah, 50th and 8th. And I'm going down the steps. And as I'm going down the steps, I know that there's this bottleneck developing towards the bottom where you kind of open up into the plaza where you can go and get your metro ticket and go through the gate to go down to the subway train itself. There's this bottleneck, and it's backing up the steps. And I got people coming down from behind, and I got people not wanting to go forward. And I'm wondering what's going on, so I'm going on tiptoe trying to see down. And I, I sidled over to the side where I could get close to the rail, and I was trying to see what was going on as I'm going down those steps. And I saw at the bottom of the steps a man lying across the threshold. He had a bowl on his chest and a sign over his face saying, please help. And as we slowly descended towards the threshold, I was noticing people would either step over him or they would step on him or even worse as they passed they would kick him and spit on him I was faced with a quandary because I didn't want to do any of those things. I didn't want to even step over the man. I, I, want, I, I wanted to turn around and run away. And so I turned around and looked up, and there's no way I could get down up those stairs. There's so many people coming down. The, it'd be like trying to put water in the opposite direction. There's no way I could get up those steps and out of there and go down a couple of blocks and, and get the subway from there. No, there's no way I could do it. I wanted to avoid any responsibility, any response at all. And when it dawned on me there was nothing I could do, I turned back and I looked down and I realized I was going to have to go forward. I started to take the steps down thinking to myself, okay, I'll just pass over and avert my eyes and go as quickly as I can to the kiosk to get my metro ticket, to go through the gate and get on a train and pretend I never saw this guy. And then I realized I couldn't. I couldn't do it. Because other people around me would see that I had done it. And I wasn't wearing civilian clothing. My dress gave me away. I was wearing clerics. And there's no way... I mean, internally, if I had been just dressed in civilian clothes, I, I, I would have been tempted and I probably would have done it. I would have stepped over him and ignored him and gone on because no one would have known but me and God. But this way, everybody would know. And so as I continued to take, those were, by the way, those steps took forever as I struggled with what to do. And when I got down to the stairs, the last couple of steps, and I knew I was going to have to do something, I stopped. And I leaned over. And I said, can I help you? And the man reached up his hand, and I took it. He weighed nothing, friends, skin and bones. And I pulled him to his feet and moved him over, out of the way of the threshold, and sat him back down. And I walked away ashamed of myself for what I had wanted to do and what I would have done had it only been me and God knowing. What would you have done? We pass Lazaruses all the time in our lives. 
Lazarus who lay across the thresholds of our living. Lazarus is who are in desperate need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lazarus is, they may not be poor and sick, but they're spiritually poor and they are spiritually dying who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, who need to experience the love of God, who need to hear that in Jesus there is forgiveness. And yet we as the church are too busy arguing about doctrines and theology and structures and committees and dollars to share Jesus with them. And I'm indicting myself in that. Because every day I drive somewhere and I come to a stoplight and there's some guy there with a sign saying we'll work for food or something similar. And you know what I do? I just kind of pretend as though I'm not seeing him. Or, or worse, when I'm sitting there and I realize, uh-oh, he's coming up to my window, what do I do? I immediately pick up my cell phone and act like I'm talking on it. So maybe he won't bother me. So I can maybe have a plausible excuse, excuse for not having done anything. We pass over, we step on, we kick and spit on Lazarus is all the time in our society. Those who are spiritually poor and dead and those who are physically poor and sick too. And what are we going to do? The next time we see a Lazarus across our path, will we listen to the one whom God raised from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord? Will we listen to Moses and the prophets? Will we listen to that voice within us saying, don't step over, don't step on, don't kick, reach out and help? Or will we be ashamed of ourselves? Will we be ashamed because we didn't want to, but did it anyway? I mean, I did a good thing. I helped that guy. I ought to be proud of myself. No, I'm not. Because I didn't want to, I wanted to run. I wanted to try to sneak by. And that's what we all do. What is your answer to the Lazarus laying across your threshold? What is your answer to the Lazarus who needs to hear the gospel from you in word and in deed? What is your answer to Lazarus? In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You have been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of Northgate United Methodist Church and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2013 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information or to listen to other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at Northgate United Methodist Church, 3700 West Northgate Drive, Irving, Texas, 75062. This program was produced by Dr. Gregory Neal.